Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sonia Diaz, and I am the founding director of UCLA's Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. We're here with an esteemed panel of subject matter experts and practitioners to talk about universal vote by mail um, in the context of COVID-19. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Matt Barreto. All right. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're really pleased to be hosting this conversation today. As you know, there has been a, a substantial increase in interest in how to protect our democracy amidst this pandemic. Uh, ideas of uh, moving to universal vote by mail, securing uh, mail ballots, as well as how do we vote in person in a safe and healthy manner. These are just some of the questions that our expert panel is going to be discussing with you today. And I'm just going to give some brief introductions, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Sonia. Uh, she's going to serve as our moderator. Uh, and discussion facilitator today. Um, so we have um, Secretary of State Alex Padilla joining us today, who's uh, still logging in right now with some uh, technical glitches, uh, but he'll be on very shortly. After eight years in the California State Senate, Alex Padilla has been elected twice to serve as California Secretary of State, a position he has held since January of 2015. Uh, he is committed to modernizing the Office of Secretary of State increasing voter registration and participation and strengthening voting rights through his office. Uh, he has overseen the expansion of online voter registration, automatic voter registration, early vote centers, vote by mail, and Secretary Padilla championed the California Voters' Choice Act, which has uh, greatly expanded access here in the state of California. Uh, we'll also be hearing from uh, Pamela Carlin, who holds the Distinguished Montgomery Professorship of Public Interest Law at Stanford University, where she is also the co-director and co-founder of the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. Uh, Professor Carlin is a national leading expert in constitutional law and voting rights. She served as co-counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Deputy Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. And she's testified before the House Judiciary Committee on Constitutional Matters. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Neil Kelly. Uh, he is the Registrar of Voters in Orange County, California, a position he has held since 2006. Uh, Orange County is the fifth largest voting jurisdiction in the entire United States, serving almost 1.7 million registered voters. In 2020, uh, Kelly oversaw the transition to sending every single registered voter in his county a vote by mail ballot while still operating vote centers and ballot drop box locations. He's received numerous awards for his service, including the Public Official of the Year, a national award from the National Association of County Recorders and Election Officials. Uh, finally, we'll be hearing on our panel uh, from Mr. Chad Dunn. He is the Director of Litigation at the UCLA Voting Rights Project in the Luskin School of Public Affairs and a nationally recognized civil rights and voting rights attorney with extensive trial and appellate experience. Uh, Chad was the lead counsel in the Texas voter identification lawsuit, which blocked the strict voter ID law. And more recently, he was the lead counsel with LULAC uh, when the state of Texas attempted to purge 100,000 immigrants from its voter rolls. Uh, Chad was the lead counsel for LULAC, which successfully defeated this purge effort and allowed immigrants rightfully registered to remain on the polls. Those are our panelists, but overseeing today's discussion and moderating it will be my colleague, Sonia Diaz, who you just heard from. Uh, Sonia is the founding executive director of the Latino Politics and Policy Initiative, LPPI, which is a multi-issue public policy think tank here at UCLA. Under her leadership, LPPI has grown to be an influential source of facts, data, and policy expertise, not just in the state of California, but now nationally recognized. Prior to joining UCLA, Sonia served as the policy counsel to California Attorney General Kamala Harris and worked on issues of civil rights, criminal justice reform, immigrant rights, privacy, and technology. So now that you've heard about our uh, full distinguished panel of experts, I'm going to turn it back over to Sonia, who's going to uh, lead off with some questions, moderate a discussion, and then we'll save time to hear from you, uh, the audience, and you can submit your questions to us and our panelists as well. Sonia. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, Part of the reason that we're doing this webinar is the UCLA Voting Rights Project just released a report on automatic, um, on vote by mail, universal vote by mail called Protecting Democracy, Implementing Equal and Safe Access to the Ballot Box During a Global Pandemic. As we all 
stay at home, practice physical distancing, and think about the safety of our loved ones, this is also occurring during a presidential election year. Now, yesterday was the National Census Day. The census has already gone digital. This was pre-COVID-19. What we're gonna discuss is the ways in which we can ensure that there is meaningful electoral participation that also recognizes the serious public health threat that exists with the coronavirus. Now, one of the things that's really important is that the pandemic that we're seeing today and the governmental response is directly linked to our governance. And one of the issues that we're gonna be talking about is the way in which people can assert their voice, their opinions, and their choices, and how public policy and decision-making occurs. And that essentially will be dictated in our general election in November. So one of the things that we're gonna discuss is really this issue of universal vote by mail, which in the opinion of many of our experts here is the only viable solution in how to move forward during the pandemic. And what I will say about the UCLA Voting Rights Project report is that it's the first one that's comprehensive about every state and best practices. And we're really excited to have a local practitioner here, Registrar Kelly, but also our Secretary of State, Alex Padilla. And what I wanna um, go ahead and get started, given that the Secretary is not um, on the call yet, is thinking through right now um, to you, Chad, what are the major issues that people need to understand about this election, how one casts a ballot today, and how one should be able to cast a ballot come November and come the remaining primary elections that we see this spring and then this summer? Thank you for including me and, and thanks for the great question. One of the first places we started when we began to work on our uh, white paper that you mentioned uh, is the public health information. Uh, there's a belief among many that this is one wave of this virus and then it will dissipate and life will return to normal. But one of the things that we discovered from the medical literature and, and consulting with experts is that uh, is that these pandemics tip into, typically happen in multiple waves. We're experiencing the first one now. There'll be another uh in all likelihood behind it. And most of the literature we looked at showed that that next wave would be starting in October, November of next year when the general election started. So with that information, we wanted to envision uh, what were the best methods to employ in voting in this kind of environment. And as you mentioned, we put out a report, it's at uclavrp.org, but it lays out uh, sort of a two-step process. What should voting look like uh, in the future when we have more time to plan? Uh, like Registrar Kelly and, and the Secretary of State uh, have been able to do in California? And then what must we do immediately to ensure that there are uh, measures in place that allow everyone to vote? We can't cancel our democracy. I think I even saw uh, Leader Mitchell, Mitch McConnell say this morning that we voted in World War I, we voted in the Great Depression, we voted in the Civil War, we're going to vote this year, so how do we make that happen? And in terms of what is accomplishable in the short term is the first is that all jurisdictions need to make available no excuse vote by mail. Uh, many jurisdictions that already allow vote by mail do so only if there are uh, particular uh, circumstances. Often it's people over a certain age or people who, who have a disability or some other personal condition. The first step is, at least for this next six, seven months of elections, we're going to have to have no excuse vote by mail. We have to take the burden off of in-person voting. Uh, importantly, as part of that, uh, the postage uh, for this mail process has to be included. People uh, always have the barrier of financial cost to vote. Uh, to many people, even getting a stamp is a burden. But importantly, uh, folks who can afford stamps often can't get them. There's not a way to get postage at home during social distancing. There's all types of barriers for all people. So the postage part of the problem has to be uh, resolved. We think and we recommend in our report that states and jurisdictions should mail a report to every registered voter. Uh, unless that's uh, mandated by Congress, then there are going to have to be some alternatives uh, because some jurisdictions are going to refuse to uh, mail it to all registered voters. So in that case, if there is an option to request, it should be uh, as burdenless as possible. Uh, 
uh, people uh, should be able to request by phone. They should be able to request their mail ballot uh, through a website. Uh, and certainly they ought to be able to mail in a request. And it's an all of the above strategy uh, uh, on that point. Another thing is staffing. Uh, for those of us who work in elections, uh, we realize that most of the staff is over the age of 65 in many areas. Uh, a lot of those folks are precisely the people that shouldn't be out and about right now. And uh, so jurisdictions need to prepare for that. What we recommend in our report is that local, county, city, state employees who are otherwise not emergency employees uh, should be designated now as backup election yeah. staff. Yeah. And Chad, yeah. Chad, thank you so much for this. What I do want to encourage everybody is that the report is there and that both Dr. Barreto and Chad Dunn are updating. There's already been two updates and I want to welcome to the call Secretary of State in California, Alex Padilla. Hi, Secretary. So nice to have you this morning. And so, Secretary, we can't hear you. I see you talking. Hello, how's that? There we go. Awesome. All awesome. right. <laughs> okay, Secretary, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the second question. Um, we've already introduced sure. everybody. We have over 200 um, folks that have dialed in from across the country. And so, one of the things that's really important here is that <laughs> you are head of elections in the largest state jurisdiction in this country. And that said, a recent interview, you were quoted as saying that you were confident that counties can expand the number of who receives vote by mail for all voters come this general election. What advice do you have to your peers that are secretaries of state in, in other places that either are interested in expanding the franchise especially during this pandemic, or maybe have some apprehension, whether that's resources or political will. Um, what's sure. your sense of this? So uh, do I think it's doable to uh, significantly grow vote by mail across the country? Absolutely. In fact, I think fundamentally, we need to get to a point where every voter in America has uh, an opportunity for no excuse vote by mail in every election. Uh, I mean, in hindsight, it turns out that some of the pal policies that California has championed to maximize access to the ballot uh, make a whole lot of sense during a public health pandemic like we're living through now. So some folks are stressing, some folks are panicking, some folks are being deliberative about how do we approach this November's uh, election. Uh, and if there, if if the question is, are, can we do it in the in the time uh, that we have between now and November? I say yes, because I know this guy named Neil Kelly in Orange County, uh, who is great at what he does, and Orange County has been a success story in how you, you ramp up significantly uh, and, and deal with the logistics, deal with the planning, deal with the public education that's necessary. Uh, but uh, Sonja, in your question, uh, I think you, phrased it as my, my counterpart secretaries of state from other states that are interested in it or looking into it. The good news is there's a lot of those. Uh, every state starts from a different place when it comes to vote by mail. There's some states that have a lot of vote by mail experience and voters have gotten used to it, like in Oregon and Washington and Colorado now and increasingly in California but you have some states where vote by mail is nearly non-existent. And so it's one thing to go from, you know, 75% vote by mail participation to 100. It's a whole different ball game if you're going from zero to 100 in a short time window. So first comes the willingness, first comes the vision, first comes you know, the leadership and the belief that this is essential uh, in a health pandemic or not in a health pandemic, but especially during a health pandemic. And this is something that we can't wait until October to try to start accomplishing. So, uh, you know, I know that uh, I've been talking nonstop to other secretaries of state for several weeks now, and my team has been talking to their counterparts uh, across the country. The time to, uh, you know, make that decision is now because there's a lot of logistics involved, as Neil can tell you, more in detail from purchasing of equipment to talking to print shops on 
you know, really increasing the number of ballots, the type of ballots, the envelopes, the design of envelopes and ballots themselves. If you're going to more vote by mail than more in-person early voting, you have a lot of equipment to test once it's delivered and staff to train, you know, once it's on hand, all this needs to be done in advance of the November election, but it certainly is doable, makes a whole lot of sense from a public health perspective and more fundamentally from a voting rights perspective. Thank you, Secretary. And what's so great about your comments is that we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how one does this. And, and you shared a long list. And I think the point there is that we need to start now. But what I think and take solace in is that this is not the first time that we're dealing with this. So I'm going to kick it over to Professor Carlin and then Registrar Kelly. Professor Carlin, you study this. You study the ways in which the American democracy operates, our electoral processes. What has your research shown? How is this moment both unique and not that different? And what's the path forward? How is COVID-19 really going to change the ways in which we vote in this country? So as you, as you alluded to, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, doing this webinar. I think it's really useful for people to have more information about just how the system works. And you know, Chad alluded to this as well, but this is not the first time Americans have voted during a crisis. Uh, and one of the things about uh, American ingenuity is that we've responded to those crises in the past by ensuring the right to vote and changing our laws. So just to use two examples that people may find especially interesting, uh, during the Civil War, uh, Americans created the right to absentee voting. It used to be that you had to show up at the polling place on a particular day in November. Uh, but we needed to keep the troops in the field during the Civil War. And so Abraham Lincoln um, you know, needed the troops in the field. And so a number of the Union states created absentee ballots. So soldiers did not have to return home uh, and give up the fight. Uh, and during World War II, we recognized that the economic pressures on uh, soldiers were quite different than uh, they, were, they had otherwise been. And so Congress passed a law eliminating the poll tax for people who were in the armed services. And that was the opening wedge in getting rid of an economic barrier to voting. So we know these things can be done, but as Secretary Padilla said, it requires both the political will and the expertise to do them. And one of the things that has changed dramatically in the United States uh, over the past uh, decade or so is a level of political polarization that has changed uh, has changed the what has long been a bipartisan uh, commitment uh, and remains a bipartisan commitment uh, when it comes to people like registrars of voters and the like, but at the national level does not seem to be a bipartisan commitment to making sure that every American who's eligible to vote can get a ballot, can cast that ballot and have that ballot counted. And so one of the things that we are coming into this election season already having had which I think is a problem, is a decline in trust in American institutions generally, so that people are less confident in the election system than they had been in decades past. And that would have been true even if we didn't have uh, COVID-19. What COVID-19 has added to this is um, it's put stress on a system that's already organized in uh, a way that's difficult to manage, which is huge parts of uh, the election process are devolved down to the 3,100 county level uh, governments in the United States, people like Registrar Kelly. Now those county governments are under additional financial strain dealing with things involving public health, public schools, uh, public safety, uh, hospitals and the like. Uh, and so they need money to do the things that are necessary to run a full and fair election. The estimates are somewhere between two and four billion uh, additional dollars have to be funneled to counties. And that sounds like a huge amount of money, but it's really about $15 a voter. And if you just think about the things that uh, Secretary of State Padilla mentioned, you know, postage, printing, uh, machines to count, uh, extra, uh, you know, overtime for people to work on, it doesn't seem like that much to protect our democracy to spend that money. Um, because so many more people will be voting by mail, and I'll leave the discussions of the details uh, to experts like the Secretary of State and, uh, and the Registrar, but because of that, one of the things that's likely to happen, and I think it's something that the media needs to prepare people for, is we are not likely to know on election night what the results are. 
That is, people have gotten used to the idea that, you know, the polls close at 8 p.m. and at 8.02, uh, the maps change color on national TV. And if you have a lot of people voting by mail, even if they're required to have the ballots postmarked ahead of election day, and in some states they are, and in other states they're not, um, by the time those ballots get counted, uh, by the time signatures get verified in states with signature verification and like, it's not going to be it's not going to be uh, the the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. It's likely to be quite a bit later that week, and it's really important that people not assume anything about exit polls or polling data, you know, public opinion polls, uh, about what the results of an election are going to be, either nationwide or for some of the local elections. Thanks so much for that, Professor Carlin. So I just want to tell folks that are dialing in that you can go ahead and write your questions to us, and we're going to have an audience Q&A at the end. Registrar Kelly, I want to kick it off to you. So beginning this year, before we expected the pandemic to be at the level that it is, both in this state and nationally. Orange County, California, regardless of how the voters registered, received a vote by mail ballot. Can you talk about the transition that occurred in your jurisdiction um, to implement this change? And then also any advice you can lend to other registrars? We have people calling in from all jurisdictions across the country. Sure, well, thank you so much for the question and thanks to UCLA LPPI for the good work that you do. Um, I'm gonna describe what we've done here in Orange County and I realize that may be a little different for other counties that might be smaller or medium sized, but really if you scale it, it's all doable like the secretary said. Uh, and you know, a few years ago under Secretary Padilla's leadership, the Voters' Choice Act uh, began expanding and moving through the legislature here in California and eventually we ended up with a bill that I thought was very doable um, and that was uh, transitioned into law, which does three things essentially. You mail every voter a ballot, like you described. You would have 11 days of in-person voting uh, where a voter could vote at any location in the county. You're no longer bound by your precinct. And then the third was, is uh, that you had that capability of returning your ballot in many different ways. For instance, you could drop it off at a drop box or you could mail it postage free uh, to our location. You know, the, the thing that I think that most people have to think about is what is the percent of vote by mail usage in the jurisdiction? Uh, here in Orange County, we were at about 60% when we started to make this transition. But the voters reacted, and the voters reacted in a big way. When you look at the March primary numbers uh, from just a few weeks ago, we had about 82% of our voters in the total turnout, which was the highest, by the way, since 2000 that used a vote by mail ballot. Compare that to just a few years ago, which was about 30 points lower. So voters will adapt, voters will accept this. And voters are looking for that opportunity for not only expanded uh, access, but more, more a better experience for the voters. And I, I don't know if it was fortuitous for us to have this infrastructure in place based on this pandemic, but there are certainly things counties can do in the short term to ramp up and get ready for a November election potentially that could be mostly vote by mail. You know, this is really helpful. And, and one of the things we're talking about this because of the pandemic that we find ourselves in. But that said, there has been a real thoughtful and deliberate attack on voting rights across the country in particular jurisdictions. So now as we see that escalating during COVID-19, I wanted to talk to Chad. Chad, you recently filed a lawsuit in Texas because again, we're in a presidential election. We have we had primaries, Texas was on Super Tuesday and there's now a democratic runoff. What's happening in Texas during COVID-19? And, and tell us kind of the landscape there. Well, so one of the things that we wanted to start looking at is what do individual state laws provide? Uh, and some states are ahead of others, as the secretary mentions. And in Texas, the situation is that people over the age of 65 can vote, or if you have a disability or injury, you can vote. Uh, and that's, and of course, military and overseas personnel are also entitled under federal law to vote by mail. And that's generally the category of folks who, who can vote in Texas. And so one of the things we've asked the state court to do is clarify that an injury or disability under existing state law includes people who are social distancing, whether by government order or because they believe that they need to. Uh, so that uh, there can be that clarity, number one, for the voters to start planning themselves that, that that's how they can cast ballots in this July runoff, that our uh, primary runoff's been moved to July 
And also, and importantly, so the 254 counties in Texas uh, that are run by election administrators uh, can get to work on figuring out how to scale up, as Registrar Kelly mentions, for an election that, that very quite possibly is going to be largely by mail. So ultimately, we think the state court will rule on that. There are some helpful attorney general opinions that sort of say that the government is shouldn't be in the business of questioning people's juris, uh, uh, justification for injury or disability. Uh, so that's an important step. And I think for other people on this on this call, on this webinar, who are in other locations, the first place to look in your jurisdiction, if you don't have election uh, uh, officials at the statewide level that are focused on access is where, where could your state law be adjusted by courts or, or by a collaborative relationship with your secretary of state, or if your legislature is in session, or if your constitution allows the governor to mandate, where can you adjust state law? Uh, and then if, if that's not possible, transition to some of the you know possible federal claims, which I'm sure Professor Carlin will get into at some point. Thanks, if, uh, thanks, Chad, for that. So we have a question from the audience tonight, and we'll ask this for you, Secretary Padilla, and anybody else, sure. which is how do we ensure that our limited English proficient voters and our first-time voters are able to cast a meaningful ballot if we do have vote by mail that is universal in all of the jurisdictions? Right. No, that's a, that's a great question, and uh, part of the solution is baked into the process. Uh, under the Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, all voting and elections materials are, each state is required to make them available uh, in uh, other, in languages other than English when there are sufficient, you know, concentrations and densities of people who speak that other language. So, you know, for the Latino community, the obvious one is Spanish and big parts of California, and statewide in California, Texas, elsewhere. Uh, those materials are available. Number two, uh, when you're registering to vote, one of the questions that appears on that voter registration form is, you know, do you prefer to receive your materials in a language other than English? So you can set that as a default for your ballot, for your voter information guide, et cetera. Those are sort of legally required and mandated through a combination of federal and state laws what isn't uh, as required, but is critical as well, is all of the public education and voter education uh, campaigns and materials, whether it's you know letters to voters, whether it's social media initiatives, whether it's paid media, television, radio, newspaper, et cetera. Uh, a smart election administrator at the state and local level will be doing things in multiple languages, not just in English. So. You're right, voting by mail uh, is smart from a voting rights standpoint, a public health standpoint, but it's only as effective as we educate the public and we recognize that it's not just California, it's not just Texas, the whole country is very, very diverse and we need to communicate to voters in the diversity uh, of languages that make up our beautiful country. That's really great and we have another question from the audience and, and maybe you, Professor Carlin, might be able to answer this as well. Um, which is it's really a question from a philanthropic organization saying if they want to support universal vote by mail, where's their entry point? And I was just, one of the things even going into 2020 that I was very cognizant about is that this is a U.S. census and a presidential election. And that means that we need to have trusted messengers. And I see a change in the electoral process as, as supremely important now. So where do people plug in that are maybe non-governmental civil society organizations? So I'm not an expert in where they where they should plug in. There are a variety of groups that are try variety of civil society groups that are very involved in this, ranging from you guys at UCLA to the Brennan Center to VoteAtHome.org, uh, the Hewlett Foundation. I mean, there are a number of places that are involved in, in this. Um, the the thing I will just say, and I want to echo something that Secretary of State Padilla said, which is. Um, and, and this is also something that Registrar Kelly pointed to, is there are some people who are going to need assistance in voting. Um, and that's why even in places that go to universal vote by mail, uh, they often have voting centers or they have government officials who are able to help people. Uh, in addition to having the right to have your ballot uh, in another language, if you live in one of the section 203 jurisdictions, uh, that's a federal provision a federal provision for places that have substantial numbers of uh, non-English proficient voters. 
Um, there are also, there's also a federal right to have assistance uh, in casting your ballot if you request it and, and you need it. And so one of the things I think that we're trying to do with vote by mail is uh, if you think about in-person voting, it's a little bit like those ventilators that people are talking about. You can't overwhelm it with people, but there are going to be people who need it. Uh, and so some of this is trying to flatten the curve of voting by having people vote early or have people vote by mail or dropping off their ballot so that those people who actually do need assistance in casting a ballot for whatever reason uh, can get that assistance uh, either through early voting or on election day itself because there are a lot of people who are in uh, that kind of position. The, the other thing I will say, and this goes back uh, to the point that Chad was making about um, you know, voters' uh, right to uh, an absentee ballot is that states are gonna have very different rules about what counts as an excuse uh, sufficient to vote. Uh, some states, for example, will allow you to vote if you are ill on election day, but you still have to provide a copy of your photo ID and for people who are at home but don't have scanners or don't have the technological sophistication to understand how to take a picture on their phone and then mount that picture on their phone onto their computer and attach it to a ballot, those people are going to face difficulties as well. And so we need to be thinking about a huge amount of, you know, it, not every state is California where there's both existing law and a political commitment, uh, a bipartisan political commitment to making sure every vote, voter who is eligible to vote gets that ballot. Thank you so much, Professor Carlin. We have another question. This one is from Carl Smith, and this is for you, Registrar Kelly. What are your suggestions about best practices for validating mail-in ballots? And I'll share that the Voting Rights Project report also goes into this. No, that's a great question. So uh, I, I think that what's really important is that you have proper training, number one. Uh, I think, you know, our operators that look at uh, the ballots and the signatures go through a very detailed training program that is conducted by people that have been trained by our local sheriff's department on signature verification. Um, the law is very clear, though, in California that it's the layperson's uh, expectation of how that signature should be compared. And so we're looking really at three points on that signature when we're doing the matching. And if we have a situation where uh, a signature needs to be looked at even closer for validation, we escalate it into three tiers. So it goes into a second challenge uh, location for people to look at, and then a third location for individuals to even dive into it further. The point here is though, to make sure voters are enfranchised. The last thing we want to be doing is scrutinizing signatures to the point where we're disenfranchising voters that shouldn't be disenfranchised. So I, I guess my, my real point there is to have the proper training, to have the proper escalation procedures in place. And then in California here, we have a process where we now can reach out to voters if their signatures do not match. We're required to, and if they haven't signed their ballot and they have time to cure that, I think that's really important, especially as we move to a, a broader uh, use of vote by mail. Awesome. Chad, really quickly, what are your cure best practices um, for signatures on these mail-in ballots? Well, a lot of it is what the registrar mentions. It's good training for the people and, and, and publish standards in advance if there's going to be signature match. But some of the scholarship on this, which we cite in our report, uh, much of it coming from Dan Smith at the University of Florida, shows that in a lot of places that don't have the best signature match systems, we see a higher percentage of ballots rejected from Latino and African-American voters. So this is critical stuff. And there are protections in place. I'll just mention one other, uh, and that is to make sure there's an adequate cure period uh, for people whose signatures are caught in the trap of p potentially not matching, giving them opportunities to cure those ballots and make sure they're counted and giving them a long window to do so. So, hey, uh, can I add one thing? Uh, Neil, hey. you wanna talk about uh, uh, where's my ballot? You know, it's not signature specific, but another uh, sort of follow where the, the ballot is physically going to a voter, coming back from a voter that gives more peace of mind and confidence in the system. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, if you have the, the options of putting barcodes on your return ballots, uh, as well as the outbound side, you can have full visibility from your ballot from the time it's mailed to the voter till the time we receive it. So what that does is essentially a voter, it's like tracking a FedEx package. You would have a situation where 
a voter uh, can go on to our website or can be text message. We'll uh, send them a text message alerting them that their ballot's in the mail. And then when they pop it back in the mail to us, the text messages will tell them once it's arrived and what the adjudication is of that ballot. And to the secretary's point, that provides a level of confidence that is really important for voters, especially when they're using a vote by mail process versus in person. Great, I have um, questions that I'm gonna combine. One from Jonathan Flores about outreach to the Latino electorate on a mass scale about vote by mail. And then one from Sarah O'Brien about those that are in the lower socioeconomic communities um, that can't necessarily uh, engage in the same way, maybe have lower propensity of going to the ballot box. What are some of the best practices to ensure that voters from communities of color and poor communities are able to fully participate in the election if indeed it is a universal vote by mail. And, and Matt, feel free to jump in, Secretary, Professor Carlin. <laughs> if, uh, if you don't mind, let me, let me say a couple things up top, uh, including, you know, uh, we gotta be precise when we're talking about this stuff because most people will, keep, will say or hear universal vote by mail and it will be interpreted as vote by mail only. But it's important to distinguish, number one, how voters receive their ballot. We're talking and, and advocating for every voter to be able to receive their ballot in the mail without an excuse. The second part of the process is how the ballot gets returned, right? And uh, as Neil can explain, there's multiple ways for people to return the ballot. You can return it by mail. So one specific thing that we can do uh, to just make sure there's no excuses, no impediments is, for states and counties to cover the return postage, right? The last thing you want is somebody's voting rights, you know, being sacrificed for scrambling for a stamp, right? Can't go to the, the post office anymore. Uh, uh, and number two, in Orange County and many other places, local jurisdictions uh, install ballot drop boxes throughout the region. So it's kind of like a mailbox, but clearly for ballots only. Uh, and any voter can drop it off at any drop box in their county, convenient to them. But there's still a need and an important role for that in-person experience that we've been talking about. For people who prefer it, I think that's their right. For people who need assistance, language or otherwise, it's also, uh, it's, it's also how same-day registration works, by the way. Uh, so uh, we don't want to disenfranchise somebody who's eligible simply because they didn't register so far in advance. So we need to maintain that in-person option only. Uh, the one recommendation that I do have, and this is part, you know, for the campaigns out there, both sides of the aisle, part for the advocacy organizations, you know, let's make voting fun. When, when more people are voting by mail and certainly these jurisdictions that uh, are, are sending out ballots to everybody, much more likely for friends and family to gather, you know, maybe through a the proper physical distancing at the moment, but gather to have the conversation of who are you voting for, here's who I'm voting for, and not just to discuss what's on the ballot, but to make sure people are voting, answering each other's questions about uh, the process as well. Thanks for that. Any other comments? How, what's, what are the messages that are gonna be important for the Latino community and other communities of color? Matt, you're a public opinion specialist. Any thoughts here? <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the secretary mentioned it. You want to make sure there's that good outreach. We have not just in the Latino community, but in the Asian American community, record numbers of first time voters, uh, people who are becoming naturalized citizens, people who are turning 18. These electorates are growing very dramatically. And as we think of new voting methods, we need to make sure we're doing that outreach. This is something that civic groups, organizations can be involved in. But you have to have leadership from the top. And so you have to have that outreach coming from either your secretary of state or your county registrar or county clerk. There needs to be information sent out. They have a list, everybody, everybody who's registered to vote. They need to be doing that outreach. And we're lucky here in California, uh, as well as other states on the West Coast, like Oregon and Washington, other states like Colorado, they're doing these sorts of efforts. They're doing that outreach. It's not uh, rocket science. It's not impossible. You have those lists of voters. Let's inform the voters so that they have a chance to be heard. And I think a little bit of extra attention needs to be heard to those first time registrants. When someone comes on the voter registration roll for the first time, let's celebrate that. Let's engage them, uh, especially as we're moving to a new um, method 
perhaps of uh, vote by mail. So the more outreach, the better. And I think you have a lot of good examples in some of the Western states. And can I just and I add think one that quick this thing? is a place. Yes, please register. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that in addition to that, targeting the message is really important because we have communities here in Orange County that are very diverse. Uh, for instance, our Latino community uh, in Anaheim and Santa Ana, you know, that messaging needs to be different than, for instance, if we're messaging to the Asian American community in Garden Grove and Westminster and making sure that you're addressing the concerns of those voters and uh, communicating properly what kinds of options they have for dropping off their ballots if they're used to going to in person or if they're used to voting by mail, what are the options that they have differently than it was before? So I think the messaging is really important. So oh, I have a question here from Ms. Pamela Smith, and it's also something that I had written down in my notes, which is there are both people and jurisdictions that are uncomfortable with the idea of vote by mail for a variety of reasons. And some of them have been proffered as late. I know that we talked about Senator McConnell and his comments recently. Can someone just explain the ease and safety of voting by mail, especially with respect to the pandemic? Sure. And then well, let's that... talk about security as well. Right, and uh, let, let me jump in, I think, with, with the context first and then let you know, Neil, Chad, others you know, chime in with the specifics. But um, you know, we're talking about vote by mail for a reason. We are living in unprecedented times as it pertains to public health and public health risks. But if we step back and look at the history of our country, Americans have gone to the polls in times of peace, in times of war, in good economic times, in times of economic recession, and yes, even during prior flu pandemics, right? So we've got to look first and foremost at the resiliency of our democracy. And while you know we're in the middle of the presidential primary election season, uh, and some states are postponing their elections or changing how they're gonna conduct the primary election, when it comes to the November election, it is not a matter of if, and it is not a matter of when, because we have a date. Tuesday, November 3rd is general election day in America. The question is how we will provide the opportunity for people to vote, because we must and we will, but do so in a way that preserves voting rights and access to the ballot, election security, and public health. And it's through these measures, through these models that we've seen be effective in many states, like vote by mail, that we can do that. But it's you know not just looking at vote by mail, and I may or may not be comfortable, let's put it in the context of history, and let's put it in the context of today. Come November, we hope and pray that we have flattened the curve and the pandemic is well behind us, but there is no guarantee. So as elections officials, we can hope for the best, but we got to prepare for the worst. How do we maintain the November election in a way that's accessible, but safe and healthy for everybody? I believe vote by mail is a core element of how we could and should prepare, but we can't wait till October to do it. We need to start planning and preparing now. I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions here, and, and there's one theme that continues, which is, you know, this distrust to vote by mail or some sort of cybersecurity, security threats that still exist given what happened in our 2016 election. Any responses to that? You can't hack a paper ballot. That's right, I was just gonna say that. Yeah. Uh, you you know, that. the fact is that vote by mail is a paper ballot and that's a human readable paper ballot. And when you have that physical piece of paper, if you have to go back and audit that for any reason, if you have security concerns, you have that ability to go back and have individuals recount those ballots and to look and reconstruct that election if you have to from a paper ballot. And the other piece of this is, is that that voter record is tied to a single ballot. And when that ballot is returned, only one ballot can be returned from that voter. And uh, it's really important to talk about those security measures as well, because I think sometimes that's left out of the conversation. I do think one thing it's very important and uh, Registrar Kelly alluded to this a couple of minutes ago, is giving voters the confidence. I mean, there, there are two kinds of concerns you might have about vote by mail. One is people voting who shouldn't. And I think uh, the registrar has explained every, you know, how you, how you manage that by making sure there's signature verification and one vote per person. Um, but there is this worry, and we found this in some of the litigation I've done, 
that there are communities um, that don't feel that their ballots will be counted if they're sent by mail. And so that ballot tracing that he talked about is also, I think, essential to giving people uh, confidence that when they get a vote by mail ballot, that that ballot has been counted either by its being received again uh, through the postal service, or they can see it going into a ballot box, um, either at a vote center or where there are dedicated boxes, or they simply hand it in again at, a, at the place they're entitled to vote in person on election day. Because if they come with the ballot already prepared, um, then they don't have to stand in line. Uh, to receive a ballot and to sign in and the like. And so in that sense, there's another kind of historical example here, which is it used to be uh, until the 1840s that Americans prepared their own ballot at home, came to the voting place and turned that ballot in. And now we have a kind of a hybrid system where the government prepares a ballot for you, but then you prepare it at home and you can vote it. And giving people the confidence that those votes will be counted and counted fairly is uh, you know, is critical to having an election that people have confidence about. But as the registrar says, that's a technical problem that can be solved. It's not an insoluble problem. Now, I have a question for the lawyers on on this panel. So if Congress doesn't act and does not act in the way that previous Congresses have, either during recessions, during war, during pandemics, is there an equal protection claim under the 14th Amendment around voting by mail? So the answer to that is, um, like almost everything in the law, it depends. Um, and so there are two kinds of claims that could be brought. One is a kind of classic, uh, you are depriving me of my right to vote. And that would be true in states that have some form of vote by mail that a person doesn't qualify for. Uh, so, for example, um, in a state where uh, the definition of illness or the definition of disability that the state uses doesn't allow you to say, I'm staying home not because I'm already uh, testing positive for the coronavirus, but because I'm afraid I'll catch the coronavirus if I go to the polls, um, those people, I think, have a potential claim uh, under what's called substantive equal protection, but it's really kind of halfway between equal protection and the fundamental rights strand of federal uh, law. Then there are two other kinds of claims that you may see uh, that we haven't seen much of in the past, but I could imagine here. One of them is uh, there, there are several states that allow for no excuses, uh, vote by mail for people over the age of 65, but for people under the age of 65, either don't allow for that at all or require them to produce IDs that older people don't have to produce. Um, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which really hasn't been litigated hardly at all, um, provides that states cannot discriminate, deny, or abridge the right to vote uh, on account of someone's age once that person has turned 18. And the question whether treating voters over the age of 65 differently from voters under the age of 65, in a in particularly in a time of pandemic, um, that's a very real question, especially if, for example, you have a state that says, people over the age of 60 should stay home. So you have people who are under 65, but over the age that the state is telling them not to go out and therefore not to go to the polls. Well, that might be a 26th Amendment question. And then for those of our listeners who remember the 2000 election, uh, you'll remember in Bush versus Gore, uh, the Supreme Court said when you have a statewide rule about counting, but that rule gets applied differently in different parts of the state, that can give rise to an equal protection claim. And so if you have a state where some of the registrars have very different standards for signature verification than others of the registrars, so that a ballot would have been counted if it was cast, let's just take examples from Florida, in Broward County, but isn't counted if it was cast in Lee County, that raises an equal protection uh, possibility as well. Um, so it's important to have statewide standards. Um, and I'll just add to this that a number of states obviously have provisions in their own state constitutions about full and fair elections and how the state courts will evaluate those claims is another aspect uh, going forward of where you may see litigation. And the one thing we know about elections is it's absolutely critical to have the rules in place and clear ahead of time. Uh, you do not want to be making up rules on the fly uh, 
close to the election, and you certainly don't want to be making up the rules after the election has already occurred to figure out who's won and who's lost, which is why the planning now is so critical for ensuring a full and fair election uh, in November. Thanks, Professor Carlin. We have a question from Peter, and this is for the secretary and also for the registrar. Where do states go for resources on best practices, and then where can local jurisdictions go? And I'm going to tag that onto a question from Wendy, who's the chief deputy registrar of Sonoma County. To what extent is the pandemic's impact on our workforce going to complicate the U.S. postal system? Right. No, two great, great questions there. Uh, in terms of where we go for ideas, policy innovation, best practices, those sorts of things, you know, there's a lot of uh, both uh, legal think tanks uh, that are great for research and uh, you know, identifying ideas for the future, along with advocacy organizations. You know, Brennan Center uh, for Justice at NYU is one that I think a lot of us uh, look to for both research, uh, you know, and uh, uh, ideas for, for the future. Uh, former head of the Civil Rights Division in the second term of the Obama administration, the Department of Justice, Benita Gupta now heads up the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights uh, and a leader coalition that I think a lot of us are uh, off and on involved with, developing these recommendations and ideas. Uh, from a nonpartisan standpoint, I'm a member of the National Association of Secretaries of State, where we convene a couple times a year to share experiences, share best practices, ongoing briefings and education. So there is a lot of dialogue, both from a practitioner standpoint, a legal standpoint, of course, an academic standpoint, and everywhere in between on how to continue to provide free and fair elections. The second question in terms of staffing impacts, yes, not just of the Postal Service. Uh, so thankfully, there was, a, I believe it was a, a $10 billion amount uh, in the stimulus package approved by Congress last week to buttress the U.S. Postal Service because their short-term projections, forget the long-term, their short-term projections were getting very, very dicey. So they've been buttressed for now, uh, but uh, they too are not immune from this health pandemic and need to uh, modify how they're conducting their business for our postal workers to stay safe. Um, but it, it brings about a point that wasn't in the question, what's the impact of staffing for county elections offices. Maybe Neil can touch on that. I know that we can all touch on the impact of poll worker recruitment and retention and training. You know, by and large throughout our history, who worked the polls on election day? Uh, it was seniors, it was retirees, uh, but now they're considered the most vulnerable population and maybe the most reluctant to volunteer to help us conduct our democracy on election day. So to the extent that we can preserve and maintain in-person voting options, we're going to need to recruit a new generation of poll workers, not just for this November, for beyond, but especially for this November. So before we wrap up this call, let that be sort of a call to action for everybody who's watching, you know, come November, uh, how we can safely uh, support our democracy for those who may be willing uh, to work, uh, help counties like Orange County and others, uh, conduct the election. Thanks. And then let me get some final comments from Professor Carlin from Chad and then Registrar Neil uh, Kelly, and I will go back to Matt and we'll close it up. So Great. I was just going to add, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to add to the Secretary's comments about uh, for election officials, you know, the Election Assistance Commission is doing some good work on uh, best practices and um, taking some leadership in, in this regard, as well as Homeland Security. You know, there's a lot of work being done right now in discussing the postal issues on the federal level, and uh, DHS is also leading some of those discussions. And I just wanted to add, even though it can't happen overnight for some jurisdictions, having the capacity for additional drop-off options for voters. So, for instance, if the postal system was impacted in some sort of uh, a way that you do have options for voters to return those ballots in other ways. And I think that's really important. And I'll just add, um, you know, there are places you can go both uh, on your own state's websites and then places like voteathome.org to get the information about how to request an, a vote by mail ballot in a jurisdiction that's not sending them to you uh, automatically. Uh, so, uh, you should share those with your network of friends. I mean, we're all practicing distant socializing in this time of social distancing. 
And so making sure that you share with people, this is how you get a ballot, uh, you should be doing that. Um, and you should be uh, writing to your members of the state legislature or to members of Congress uh, if you're in a state that isn't one of the states that's already providing this stuff and demanding that they help you uh, exercise your right to vote in November. I'll just add, as by way of closing, uh, first, you, uh, for, by way of resources to add to the list, uclavrp.org. We have a number of reports here, including this white paper we've talked about today. We have uh, collected uh, some medical literature on the safety of the mail. We've also done a comparison of the uh, of Speaker Pelosi's vote by mail bill to make it some consideration this next go round of relief measures and some other items that folks can use. And, and the last thing I want to sort of observe uh, is as somebody that's been fighting voting rights battles for going on 20 years now. The sad reality is there's a lot of places in this country that are not going to willingly go to wide scale vote by mail. And uh, some of the claims that Professor Carlin talked about are going to have to be pursued. Some of the state law claims that I discussed are gonna to need to be pursued. But I just wanted to take one second and talk about legal procedure, because I think it could be helpful in a lot of places. Uh, Lawyers often go into federal court in what's called friendly suits. Most of us are used to hostile suits, but they're also friendly suits. And in, if you're in a jurisdiction where the legislature can't meet or because your state constitution doesn't allow the governor to sort of set aside laws, one of the things you can do is get into the federal courthouse with one or several of these claims Professor Carlin mentioned. If you have cooperative state officials, you can work out an agreement there that could be ordered by federal court order to apply to your jurisdiction. And if you don't have cooperative officials, then you're going to need to prove the evidence uh, to prove up these various claims. A lot of the information we provide on our website will help you do that. And certainly plenty of, plenty of these folks will be here. But the important point is we're not going to cancel our democracy. We are so thankful to Secretary Padilla and Registrar Kelly for their leadership and what they've done in California and, and the model they provide to the rest of us. And now as we adjourn this call, it's on all of us to double our commitment to democracy and find a way to make this work in all 50 states and territories. Thanks, Chad. Hey, everyone, this is Matt Barreto of uh, UCLA. I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we've covered a lot of important topics from policy recommendations to the actual implementation, uh, as well as legal strategies on how to fight for this. Um, we will all be available for further comment and follow-up. Uh, as Chad mentioned just now, you can go to either uclavrp.org, that's the UCLA Voting Rights Project, or you can go to latino.ucla.edu, that's the Latino Policy and Politics Initiative at UCLA, which has this information available. Uh, you can find that information uh, on either of those websites and, as well as um, some of the other uh, outlets. Uh, I also encourage you to go visit directly to your local uh, county registrar and see what they're doing, as well as your state. Um, the Orange County Registrar, as well as the California Secretary of State, have much of this information available to us uh, and for us to download and review. Um, and if you have any final uh, questions or comments, as I said, do not uh, hesitate to reach out the way that you registered and signed up for this webinar. You can reach all of the experts that are here. Uh, we'll be happy to answer additional follow-up uh, questions and interviews. And we thank you again for your commitment to protecting our democracy this year. But as you heard from Secretary Padilla, we have an opportunity to protect it during this pandemic, but this is something that all states should be doing to encourage additional voter participation and engagement. We should be enacting these measures everywhere, every year, to make sure that all voters have a right to vote in the manner that they think uh, is most appropriate. So those are my final uh, comments. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, I'll turn it back over to you to conclude this webinar and thank all of our uh, panelists for attending today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Thank you for our audience who were so engaged and asked such critical questions. I think we were able to talk about matters of policy, procedure, and litigation. Uh, we obviously are available and eager to support with, through technical assistance, through research and data. And I want to especially thank our esteemed panel. Thank you, Professor Carlin. Thank you, Chad Dunn. Thank you, Registrar Neal. Kelly. <laughs> And thank you, Secretary of State Alex Padilla. I hope that everybody um, on this call is well and safe. And I think that we will get through this together. And I hope that all of us that are eligible will vote and all of us will continue to talk about the important role that this election plays in our health and safety. Thank you all. <laughs>